The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 5970 in the name of Mary Fee on tackling homophobia in sport. And the debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Mary Fee to open the debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In opening this debate, can I take this opportunity to welcome LGBT rights campaigners and activists to the public gallery? And can I also thank members from across the chamber for supporting my motion, tackling homophobia in sport, allowing this debate to take place? Almost two decades since the formation of this parliament, there have been massive gains in LGBT rights in Scotland. These rights, such as equal marriage, have been hard fought for by tens of thousands of strong, proud LGBT activists and campaigners. Yet, despite these advances, discrimination against LGBT people continues to persist in all walks of Scottish society. Recent research from Stonewall Scotland highlights the particular issue of LGBT discrimination in Scottish sport. A staggering 46% of LGBT people do not find sporting events to be welcoming spaces. More than one in 10 LGBT people avoid going to the gym or participating in sports groups because of fear of discrimination and harassment. And for trans people, this figure shoots up to 39%. And it's clear that there is a particular issue with LGBT discrimination in Scottish football and football more generally. Research by the Equality Network back in 2012 identified football as the sport which has the biggest challenge to overcome in relation to LGBT inclusivity. And it's vitally important that the culture in sport, and in particular football, must change. Education, LGBT rights campaigns, and visible role models are all important mechanisms which can help in the battle to eradicate LGBT discrimination in football and in wider society. And I'd also like to mention Leap Sports Scotland, an LGBTI sports charity who work for inclusion of LGBT sports particip participants and work to tackle homophobia and transphobia. And I had the pleasure of meeting staff and volunteers of Leap Sports during the 2014 Commonwealth Games at Pride House in Glasgow. And I would encourage members and visitors to the gallery to visit their website and see what they can do to support the work of this organisation. Presiding officer, research by Stonewall Scotland has revealed that a shocking 70% of fans have heard homophobic abuse in the stands at a football game. And one of the respondents to Stonewall's research commented, and I quote, men in the crowd around me at a football match use the term gay in a derogatory manner to refer to the players on the pitch. It made me extremely uncomfortable, but I didn't feel in a position to challenge them. Common forms of discrimination experienced by LGBT people when participating in or spectating at sport is the use of homophobic or transphobic language, as well as stereotypes about sexual orientation and gender identity. And such stereotypes are dangerous and only serve to reinforce prejudice against LGBT people. And based on Scottish Government statistics regarding sexual orientation, around 100,000 people in Scotland identify themselves as LGB and other. However, there are still no openly gay or bisexual male professional footballers in Scotland or across the UK. And the lack of a visible role model for LGBT people in professional football in Scotland is of real concern. A lack of a visible role model makes it extremely difficult for a young gay or bi male to feel confident about being themselves if they can't see anyone else like them in the sport. And it's incredibly important that the governing body of Scottish football, professional football clubs, LGBT groups and this parliament work collaboratively to create the right environment for players to feel comfortable about coming out. And I was extremely pleased to see 13 professional football clubs take the lead in eliminating LGBT discrimination by signing up to the Equality Network's LGBT Sports Charter. And current signatories to the Sports Charter are Aberdeen, Airdrie, Albion Rovers, Celtic, Dumbarton, Elgin City, 
forefoot athletic, heart, hips, partic thistle, Peterhead, Rangers and St Johnson. And I'm aware that there are a further six professional clubs currently in contact with the Equality Network with a view to signing up to the LGBT sports charter. And Aberdeen fans have proved a shining example, leading the way in tackling homophobia and promoting equality and diversity by establishing the first LGBT supporters group in Scotland, known as the Proud Dons. And Dumbarton FC have also proved themselves to be a modern and inclusive club, ensuring their commitment to equality and diversity through the club's anti-discrimination policy. In the contract of each footballer and employee of Dumbarton FC is a clause stating that the club is opposed to racism, sectarianism, bigotry and discrimination of any forum, including on the basis of gender or sexual orientation. And presiding officer, and coming to a close, I'd once again like to congratulate and thank those professional football clubs and other sporting institutions who have already signed up to the LGBT Sports Charter. And I would urge other professional football clubs and governing bodies to reach out to the Equality Network to sign up. It's vitally important that sports organisations take the lead in changing the culture in Scottish sport by tackling and eradicating LGBT discrimination to ensure that sports clubs, gyms, stadiums and arenas are modern, inclusive and welcoming to all people, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Thank you. Oh, excuse me, I've just spilt some water all over the console. If everything goes dark, <laughs> you'll know why. <laughs> we now move to the open debate and speeches of four minutes, please. Can I have Brian Whittle to be followed by Rona Mackay? That'll be me. Yep. <laughs> well prepared. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I say that although I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this debate, and I thank Mary Fee uh, for bringing it to the Chamber, I certainly take no pleasure in having to address this topic in this day and age. I find it quite depressing that the spectre of homophobic behaviour still casts such a shadow over our communities. And the topic is only one that I uh, really became aware of and began to take an interest in on joining Parliament, uh, mainly as a, a research into uh, a consultation paper I was doing around barriers to inclusion in sport and activity. And it certainly came as a shock to hear of some of the experiences uh, of in, participation in sport from the LGBTI community, stories of discrimination of bullying and sometimes worse. You see, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's a surprise to me because I can't come from a sports background and it was never an issue I was aware of during 10 years of professional sport. We were all just athletes joined by a mutual respect around our sport and the work it had taken to get to where we were. Now, I know you may find this difficult to believe, uh, uh, Presiding Officer, but I, I retired quite a long time ago. It's measured in decades. Uh, at the last millennium, in fact, or, or to put it more delicately, about two stone ago. But friendships made during that time endure to this day, irrespective of colour, creed, religion or sexual orientation. In fact, I can tell you there was never any thought or consideration given to any of those cate cate categories. Only last Sunday, as uh, old boys got together for our annual golf outing, and a more disparate group of people you could not find made the quiet man of the group, Chris Akabusi, from, from a Nigerian background, who had six foot nine, Jeff Tourbags Parsons, Scottish high jump uh, record holder who plays golf like a giraffe going for a drink. We had Captain Courageous and Derek Redmond, we had steeplechaser Eddie the Chip Wedderburn, Johnny Two Chess Regis and me, all travelled from every part of the country to meet up. And let me tell you, golf was the winner. You see, but that, that's what sport is to me, a way to break down barriers and to find commonality. It's a way to promote inclusion and participation. Everybody in here knows that I see it as a tool not only to tackle physical health, but also a major component, component of addressing poor mental health ep epidemic that we now face. Inclusivity and physical activity, as, as Sam H put it. Now, we are debating here as how certain elements of society are being excluded from these opportunities. And there have been examples in sport of poor, poor treatment of athletes, such as the uh, intersex debate around Castro Semenya. 
who is an Olympic and world 800 meter women's champion. And there may have been a genuine uh, uh, issue to investigate by, by the, double, the IWF, but they handled it so badly and with such lack of respect to the athletes' welfare that the LGBTI's community in participating in world sport was put back many, many years. Now, thankfully, she's now back competing at the very highest level and, and, and won the World Championships in London this year. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, all the briefing notes many organisations sent prior to this debate, and, and I recognise the Stonewall Scotland Rainbow Laces campaign, which I took part in last year. Um, I, I will have to say that they did take the picture of me with just one shoe on. And I would just like to say, for goodness sake, it's more than 30 years ago, will you please let it go? You see, sport should be a sanctuary for all, a place where a person's background, no matter what that may be, is irrelevant. Sport can lead in the battle against prejudice. We in this place must continue to drive this direction of travel until such prejudice, prejudices are no more in our communities. Thank you. And Rona Mackay, followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, I attended the cross-party group on sexual health and bloodborne viruses. There, we heard a moving account from an HIV-positive woman who based her talk around the word stigma. The dictionary definition of the word is a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality or person. Presiding officer, I believe everyone in this chamber would agree that being gay should have no stigma attached to it. But sadly, despite Scotland being one of the most progressive nations in the world when it comes to LGBT plus equality, when it comes to sport, there's still much work to be done. In sports, players face a disproportionately difficult time in coming out for a variety of reasons too complex to detail in a four minute speech. Recently, Gareth Thomas, a Welsh, Welsh rugby player with 100 caps, gave a grim account of his experiences of being a gay man in rugby. He believes that sport, and football in particular, must not be allowed to remain in the dark ages of homophobia. And he says, unless homophobia in football is policed as stringently as racism is policed, then it will always be a problem. And I agree with him. Recently, three former Rangers players started working with the excellent Thai campaign to clamp down on homophobia. Education is the key to changing attitudes and helping people to realise that it's simply not acceptable to perpetrate this inequality. But, presiding officer, as we've heard, sport can also be an unwelcoming and threatening environment for LGBT fans. 70% of sports fans in Scotland have witnessed anti-LGBT language or abuse in a sports setting in the last five years. Almost half of LGBT people, 46%, thinks public sporting events aren't a welcoming space, and one in 10 who attended a live sporting event in the last year experienced discrimination. Presiding officer, in 2017, this simply isn't good enough. Problems with racism, sectarianism, and homophobia are taken seriously by the SNP government, and our hate crime legislation exists to eradicate it. That's why the Scottish Government is concerned that an outright repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communication Act may send the message that prejudice-based and threatening behaviour at football is acceptable, even when other legislation could also apply. Stonewall Scotland supported the introduction of this bill in 2012, noting the serious impact that homophobic, biphobic and transphobic behaviour in sport has for LGBT people's safety and confidence to participate in sport. Discrimination discourages participation and cultivates lack of inclusion and diversity. Football and the sporting culture must not be left behind while the rest of society sees progress in equality. There's clearly a lot of work being done with 13 clubs signed up to the Equality Network's LGBT charter and more poised to do so as we've heard. Sports Scotland believes education, positive role models, embracing LGBT plus policies and promoting gay, lesbian and bisexual sports stars is the way forward and that is the path we should follow. But there's still a lot to be done and until we need no longer debate this subject in chamber, when it stops becoming a story and when people wonder why someone's sexual orientation is even being raised as an issue, we need to continue to strive for equality. It's time to blow the whistle on homophobia in sport. Uh, Monica Lennon, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking my colleague, Mary Fee, for bringing this important topic to the Scottish Parliament Chamber this evening. Homophobia certainly has no place at all in public life in Scotland. 
and no place in Scottish sport. The continuing existence of homophobia in sport is evidenced by the findings from Stonewall Scotland that 60% of sports fans have witnessed homophobic behaviour in the last five years is a sad and unacceptable state of affairs. As a nation which is so passionate about football, it's a damning indictment of how far we still have to travel in tackling homophobia in all aspects of Scottish society that a majority of football fans are likely to have witnessed prejudiced behaviour towards the LGBT community. 82% of football fans admitting that they have heard homophobic abuse or language at a sports event. That is an alarming number of people. So while Scotland has made great strides towards achieving legal equality for the LGBT community over the past few years with the commencement of equal marriage laws, it's clear we still have so much more to do to combat prejudice and inequality. Last week, most MPs, MSPs in the Chamber were able to join with the show Racism the Red Card campaign just outside the Chamber in the garden lobby to show our support for combating racism in football. I'm proud to support that campaign and just like there is no place for racism of any kind in Scottish sport, it should be equally as repulsive to us that there would be any homophobic prejudice towards the LGBT community in Scottish football. I would love to see the recommendations of the Equality Network's report and Stonewall's Rainbow Laces campaign to tackle anti-LGBT prejudice in sports gain similar traction amongst colleagues and the wider public. And I look forward to getting the opportunity later this year to, su to support the campaign. So it's my hope that we'll also see foot clubs and football clubs and fans across the country using that opportunity to engage with and embrace this important campaign. And um, my colleague Mary Fee read an impressive list of football clubs, but there's many more names that, that could be added. In the evidence gathered by Stonewall Scotland about homophobia in sport, the most troubling and striking statistic to me was how negative experiences of sport for LGBT people can often start as early as their school years. The evidence showed that one in seven LGBT young people say they have experienced bullying during school sport and almost one in five in school changing rooms. This is yet another worrying statistic and it only underlines why it's so important that we ensure we get inclusive education in our schools. Many colleagues will have noticed on their way into the chamber this evening that the Thai campaign are in Parliament again <laughs> with an exhibition of their progress so far and the aim of signing even more MSPs up to the pledge. It's been a privilege to sponsor their time in Parliament this week and I hope that many colleagues as possible will have the chance to speak to, to Jordan and Liam about their work and I noticed on Twitter earlier that, that more MSPs have signed the pledge today so it is really good that we have the Thai campaign with us in Parliament. It's only been a few months since I brought my own members debate on the Thai campaign to the Scottish Parliament and I'm pleased that the Scottish Government Working Group on Inclusive Education is continuing to make progress as ever I look forward to seeing the group's eventual outcomes and recommendations at its conclusion. We need to make inclusive education a reality in this parliament so that we can eradicate homophobic attitudes in the next generation of young people who are growing up in Scotland today. Homophobia has no place in our society and the route to tackling that begins with education. I'd just like to repeat my thanks to Mary Fee for bringing forward the debate. Mary mentioned at the start the importance of role models um, in sport, but in general. And I'd like to say, well, I have the chance because Kez is sitting next to me. Kez Dugdale, uh, of course, was uh, uh, awarded Politician of the Year uh, at the prestigious Icon Awards on Friday night. And I'd like to extend my congratul congratulations to Kez And I'm sure other colleagues across the chamber will agree. Thank you. Alison Johnson, followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd also like to thank Mary Fee for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. I agree wholeheartedly with the terms of the motion and thank all of the organisations who sent us briefings indicating the work that is going on to tackle homophobia and improve our sporting culture, as well as highlighting the unacceptable barriers to participation LGBTI people still face. In 2012, I spoke at the Out for Sport conference, launching Equality Network's report on the opportunities sport provides to tackle discrimination and to promote equalities. And their report recommended 
that there should be more visible leadership from government and from sports governing bodies, establishing a Scottish LGBT sports charter to ensure that LGBTI people are more fully included in Scottish sport. It called for more action to ensure clubs at all levels of sport, whether competitive or recreational, in our local authorities or in our universities comply with the Equality Act. It asked clubs and sports facilities to improve training for their staff and coaches, helping them to identify, prevent and challenge homophobic and transphobic bullying. And in the past five years, there have been improvements to Sport in Scotland. And now I'm glad to see Sport Scotland make new commitments to embed equalities and inclusions in all aspects of their work. I also want to highlight some of the positive work Scottish Athletics has been leading, building on their forefront runners LGBT clubs, supporting them to work with more athletic clubs and Jog Scotland groups. And Scottish Athletics also helped to pilot a non-binary athletics category, approving non-binary races for Jedburgh Running Festival. But sadly, few areas of sport in Scotland are quite so inclusive. And as the briefings I've read while preparing for this debate make all too clear, the impact of homophobia, as others have said. In sport, it's felt very early in life. In 2016, Sport Scotland's research with the Equality and Human Rights Commission showed that one of the key barriers to participating in sport for young people included homophobia and previous negative experiences, particularly in school. If we are serious about tackling homophobia in sport and making sport more accessible for everyone, we really have to tackle the bullying and discrimination that young people face. LGBT Youth Scotland's report on the legacy of the Commonwealth Games shows that LGBTI young people are less likely to engage in sport and physical activity. Homophobia in sport is holding young people back from participating in sport, and I have no doubt that this will have a negative impact on the long-term physical health and well-being of too many LGBTI young people. Stonewall's research shows that one in seven LGBT young people in, in schools in the UK have experienced bullying during school sport, and almost one in five in school changing rooms. And even if not bullied themselves, more than half of the LGBTI pupils frequently hear homophobic language in sports lessons. And it is appalling to think that such bullying, harassment and discrimination exists in our schools. My colleague Ross Greer has campaigned for a review of PSE in schools, and today's debate shows us that the upcoming review of PSE must consider sport in schools and how high quality PSE can help build a whole school approach to equalities and mental health, moving beyond the classroom and improving all aspects of school life. Recently, there's been a welcome greater focus on the potential sport has to improve mental health. The Scottish Association for Mental Health is partnering Scottish Athletics on the Jog Scotland programme, helping people to become more active. And initiatives like this show the urgent need to make sport truly accessible to all and to tackle homophobia at all levels of sport. Uh, as Mary Fee and Ronan Mackay and others have noted, homophobia in sport is not just a barrier to active participation, it's a barrier even to being a fan, a spectator. And if we want to make long-lasting changes to the culture of spectatorship, we have to work internationally as well. Out on the Field was the first international study, study on homophobia in sport. And it highlighted the prevalence of homophobia in sport on a global level. It showed that the most likely place to encounter homophobia in UK sport was on the spectator stands. And 85% of that study's participants believed that, and I'm quoting, an openly gay person would not be very safe as a spectator at a sports event. Presiding officer, given the impact of international competition on sporting culture and on societal behaviour more widely, we must think about how good practice can be shared internationally and how we can protect sports, peoples and fan, sports people and fans from homophobia wherever they are competing or supporting. Thank you. Miles Briggs, followed by Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to congratulate Mary Fee on securing today's debate and welcome the opportunity to participate in it. I'd also like to pay tribute to the work she's done on this issue for many years now within the Parliament and also thank the organisations who have provided briefings for today's debate. And I commend Stonewall and the Equality Network for the good work they have been doing around this issue over many years. All of us in this chamber will agree that homophobia should have no place in sport, just like any form of discrimination. But we have to be honest that this is not the case for so many of our Scottish sports people and Scottish fans. 
And we'll all recognise the extent of the challenges we face in tackling this issue and how much needs to change around some of the culture within sport in Scotland today. And as already been mentioned in today's de debate, that is quite stark when you consider that 60% of Scottish sport fans have heard homophobic abuse, rising to 82% amongst football fans. As Stonewall Scotland's research indicates, there is still a minority of sport fans who believe anti-LGBTI chants and abuse are, accept are actually acceptable on the terraces or in the pubs. And we all have to play our role, I believe, in helping to change this so that that type of language is seen as, in, as both intolerable as racist abuse would be. Casual homophobia amongst fan, fans shouldn't be just dismissed as macho banter, but should be challenged just as much as homophobia should be and hopefully would be in any other context in life in Scotland. The motion rightly refers to what appears to be a particular problem of homophobia within football. And like Mary Fee, I welcome the Scottish Football Association and Sports Scotland's support for the Equality Network's LGBT Sports Charter. I think the Minister and I particularly like the fact that St Johnston have um, led the trail on that. Clearly a lot of work, though, still has to be done. The fact that no professional footballer has felt able to come out in the UK since Justin Fashnu in 1990, I think sp speaks volumes about how far we still have to go before being gay and a footballer is as unremarkable as it would be in so many other professions. The lack of gay role models as a professional football level is an obvious concern. Openly gay sports people like rugby's, rugby's Gareth Thomas and Kieran Hurst Diving's Tom Daly and boxing's Nicola Adams have trailblazed in many ways and are an inspiration to many young LGBT people questioning whether they are able to take part in sport or aim for a national or international career. We should rightly put on record our admiration for their decisions to be open about their sexuality in a public way and thank them as we look forward to many other LGBT sports people excelling in their field in the future. Increasing participation in sport and boosting physical activity across all age groups is vital in terms of tackling obesity, improving the population's physical health, and indeed in maintaining good mental well-being and good mental health. Competitive and team sports encourage self-confidence, develop transferable skills, and build resilience amongst young people. And tackling for homophobia in sport should be seen as helping to remove another barrier which may prevent LGBT people participating in sport. And with a number of studies showing that LGBT people are more prone to suffering from mental ill health, this should be seen as especially important in terms of allowing them to access sport without fear that they will be a victim of any abuse or prejudice. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I again welcome today's debate and I look forward to real progress being made as we go forward. I recognise that it can take time for ingrained cultures and behaviour to change and how difficult this can be but it is right that Scotland's Parliament and all of us across all parties in this chamber unite today in sending out a clear message that the, we won't accept homophobia in sport and will work to reduce and eventually eradicate it so that everyone can have equal access to sport in an equal and welcoming basis. Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Kezia Dugdale. Thank you very much, President Officer. And uh, like colleagues, can I congratulate Mary Fee on uh, securing tonight's debate, but also leading on this issue for a number of years now, as Miles acknowledged. And also thank the Equality Network in Stonewall, Scotland, for providing their briefings for tonight's debate. It was actually when I was reading those briefings, I was reminded of the Rainbow Laces campaign that Stonewall Scotland uh, launched not so long ago. And I remember thinking at the time, even as a, an openly gay woman, that it was a bit of a gimmick, that it, it didn't mean that much. And then my political researcher at the time, a guy called Gareth Lodge, who played basketball for Scotland, sneaked the rainbow laces out the Parliament office and then wore them for an international match that he was playing in. And I saw the pictures of that the next day. And I can't tell you, President Officer, just how touched I was that somebody had decided to do that for me and other people like me. So I think we should never uh, fully underestimate uh, the value of campaigns like that and the difference that they can make. Tonight's debate is all about sport. I'm going to focus the rest of my remarks on football as the sport that I know best. It's also the one that's recognised in a number of the briefings as the one with the highest participation level among Scots. Uh, I've grown up with football. My dad was a, a referee for most of my uh, childhood, mostly in the Highland League. And I remember fondly or not so fondly sitting on the line on a football in freezing cold winters, listening to people uh, shout and swear at my dad. 
And I mostly uh, wanted to share some of those stories uh, with the Chamber this afternoon, but I've been advised by the presiding officer that each and every one of the things that was shouted at my dad constitutes unparliamentary language. Uh, one word that you would hear regularly, though, at those football matches was poof. And it would be shouted from the stands down onto the pitch, every time a player dodged a heavy tackle or if they kicked the ball uh, over the bar, you would hear it regularly. Definitely across the whole of a season, you'd hear that language, probably in each and every match. And the uh, reports that we're reading today in advance of this debate recognise now that 60% uh, of people have heard homophobic language at a sporting event, but it rises to 82% in the instance of football alone. So whilst we've made a bit of progress, there clearly is a long way to go. The good news, presiding officer, is that those same reports tell us that 68% of football fans want to see more done about it. I'm delighted to represent uh, Edinburgh and in that to now have two Premier League football teams. I've not been able to say that for a little while. <laughs> but the reality is that not only do we have two Premier League football teams, they are both chaired by women. The chief executives of both HIPs and at heart of Midlothian Football Club are women. I want to uh, pick a little fight with Mary Fee here because she said earlier on that there were no LGBT role models in male football. There is, there's one, and it's a woman. It's Leanne Dempster, who's the chief exec uh, of uh, Hibernian Football Club, my team. In fact, Hibs are a bit of a leader when it comes to LGBT sport because they also have on their books Laura Montgomery, who was the founder of Glasgow City Women's Football Club. She's a UEFA uh, official and now a senior projects manager at Hibernian Football Club. So uh, Hibs are leading the way uh, once again. I got in touch with Leanne Dempster before tonight's debate to ask her what she might like to be shared with the Chamber around this issue of tackling homophobia in football in particular. And she asked us to check our language. She's like, of course it's important to talk about tackling homophobia in sport, but equally it's about uh, it promoting inclusion in sport. And that's the attitude that Hibs are taking, trying to make it a more welcoming environment for LGBT fans and indeed players. And we've asked ourselves many times in this debate why LGBT players don't come out? Why don't they speak? Why is it that we've never in Scotland had a single openly gay football player? And the Out in Sport report, which has also been referenced from the Equality Network, gives us some indication as to why that's the case. It's also worth remembering, President Officer, that that was a report written by Margaret Smith, the first openly female gay MSP in this chamber. And she told us that uh, there were two main reasons in that report. Fear of what spectators would say, and secondly, the impact on those players' careers. Now, I've been spending a bit more time watching TV recently, presiding officer, I can't imagine why, and I've been hugely comforted by the increased number of adverts on TV which show same-sex relationships. Hopefully that's the start of a changing uh, attitude and culture towards the relationship between commercial enterprise and people disclosing their uh, sexual orientation. And finally, I appreciate I've gone over my time, presiding officer, and you're likely to be less gracious now that I'm on the back benches. I think we have to acknowledge the, the issue of gender segregation in sport. So for as long as we consider that there are boys' sports and girls' sports, we're actually perpetuating, perpetuating homophobia as well. Thank you very much. I now call Aileen Campbell to respond to this debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And like um, other speakers this evening, I want to thank Mary Fee for raising this really important issue and to everybody who has contributed to this uh, debate and also put on record our congratulations to Kezia Dugdale for becoming an icon eh, as well. We saw some of the pictures on Twitter, it looked like a, a heck of a good night that everybody had. Um, and like eh, all speakers, I believe very firmly that there should be no barriers at all to participating in sport. Everybody should be able to enjoy sport, whoever they are and whatever their background, be that on the court or pitch or in the stands or the touchline, nobody should have to put up with homophobic comments or taunts. And as Minister for Sport, I'm proud that this government and this parliament is determined to create a modern, inclusive Scotland which protects and respects human rights and that this should also extend to promotion of equal participation and access eh, to sport. And on that point, I think the words of Leanne Dempster are particularly pertinent eh, and certainly Leanne Dempster is somebody that we should all listen to because of her unique role that she's had in football and the, and the contribution, the huge contribution that she has made uh, to football. Also Laura Montgomery as well, incredibly impressive individuals who are doing so much to ensure and promote uh, tolerance in sport. So as, in terms of the government, we are committed to um, uh, 
promoting equal participation, access to sport, and tackling uh, homophobia and transphobia. And that's why we support uh, LGBT equality organisations working to reduce that discrimination and hate crime that people have discussed this evening. And in our 2017-18 programme for government, we have also made a commitment to consult on reform and gender recognition legislation and also to bring forward legislation through the Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Bill. And that will ensure that men convicted under previously discriminatory Scottish laws which criminalise consensual same-sex sexual activity will receive a pardon and will be able to apply to have such criminal conviction informed information removed from central records. And the reason we mention that is because these actions well, I think building on that, those two decades of progress that Mary Fee articulated under devolution will allow people to openly discuss their sexual orientation without feeling prejudice or the stigma which was attached in the past and even present day. And we remain committed to demonstrate the leadership needed to tackle inequalities, homophobia and transphobia in sport. Scotland demonstrated this during the 2014 Glasgow Commonwealth Games where we supported the establishment of Pride House which provided a welcoming place for people to view the games and enjoy the events and cultural programmes which supported the sporting events. And I'm pleased that the Scottish Government is again working with partners to explore opportunities to further boost the engagement of the LGBTI community during the 2018 European Championships including using the 2014 Pride House model. And as a government, we participate in the National LGBTI Sports Coordinating Group. And that group brings together partners, including Sports Scotland, Leap Sports, Stonewall, the Equality Network, the Scottish FA, amongst others, with the aim of removing barriers that may stop LGBT uh, individuals participating in sport, as well as helping to educate sport providers to be as open and accessible as they can be. Uh, but the stats from Stonewall's report show the journey that we still have to make to ensure that our ambition, our shared amb ambition of eradicating homophobia, uh, homophobia turns out from being an ambition to actual uh, reality. And many people have uh, in their contributions mentioned our beautiful game and like Mary Fee though I am encouraged that a number of SPFL clubs have already signed up to the Equality Charter and we've been encouraged by positive discussions with the SPFL as it continues to promote equality in Scottish football through its support of initiatives such as the Rainbow Laces campaign like Niles though particularly pleased to see uh, St Johnston feature highly up that <laughs> in the clubs today um, the SFE have also recently established an Equality and Diversity Advisory Board which will act as a senior supporting group to provide guidance and ensure that the FA's commitment to inclusion, equality and diversity is embedded throughout its structures, plans and activities. Also pleased though from Mary Fee's um, a contribution to hear about the Aberdeen uh, Football Club's fans initiative and also as per Joe Fitzpatrick whispering in my ear, uh, Dundee Football Club have also taken forward a similar uh, initiative very recently, Proud Dees, which they set up last month. But on the broader uh, issue of football, I think there's real opportunity to explore the potential that football has. It has that reach that I think Kezia and Mary and others have, have uh, talked about into all of our communities. It does fantastic whether that's the Game Changer project at Hibs, whether that's whatever community trust, uh, Aberdeen Football Club, they have a reach and a potential to change culture. And I think we've probably not even touched the, the, uh, the surface of what further work uh, football clubs can do in our communities to help change uh, cultures and um, uh, be a force for good. Also, however, there's lots of other uh, additional work going on. Last year, Sports Scotland and the Equality and Human Rights Commission published an equality in sport research into equality in Scottish sport, and that looked at who currently participates in sports, the barriers to participation, and suggests potential solutions. And while participation levels amongst the LGBTI population is not significantly different to the heterose heterosexual levels of participation, it is important always to treat these findings with a level of caution as the results reflect the experiences of people who are already out rather than those who aren't. And we've also heard about from speakers this evening about people's experience of the all too present bullying, the anxieties and a whole host of other barriers that stop LGBTI people becoming uh, active or enjoying uh, sports. Support. And of course, um, equalities and inclusion is one of the three priorities for improvements set out in Sports Scotland's corporate plan for 2015-19. And they are setting out a, a number of ways in which they are seeking to ensure that they support our governing bodies. Because while we have good stories to tell around Commonwealth Games 
and with the leadership at many of our governing bodies, it's that experience at a grassroots level that we need to unpick uh, and help challenge uh, as well. And so that's why the equality standard for sport, which is uh, the, there to help uh, governing bodies to ensure that they're as inclusive as they can possibly be, accompanied by training programmes, is also uh, relevant. I do want to pick out one of our um, uh, governing bodies which is doing some fantastic group in addition to athletics and a whole host of others is that the Royal Yachting Association of, of Scotland became the first governing body in Scotland and one of only two governing bodies across the UK to be awarded the advanced level of the equality standard that was set out by um, uh, Sports uh, Scotland. And a quick mention also, in addition to Alison Scott Johnson's mention of the athletics, to boxing and squash, which also have really innovative ways in which they are trying to ensure that they can reach out to communities that they may not have in the past to ensure that they can enjoy the offer that sport can bring. And also, in a couple of weeks' time, I'll be visiting Shawlands Academy in Glasgow, who have developed a Safer Sports at Schools manifesto. And that manifesto has been developed in partnership with Leap Sports and will allow all children to feel comfortable in taking part in physical uh, education. So at school level, at governing bodies, level we have plans there are strategies in place to try and ensure the inclusivity that we all desire is there in sport but there is, of course is much more that we need to do to draw my comments to a conclusion presiding officer we are becoming a fully inclusive nation but there is much more to do and i'd like to put on record my thanks to sports scotland the governing bodies leap sports and everyone else who's been involved in working together to improve equal opportunities for all and who are committed to tolerance respect and removing barriers that have persisted i commend mary fee for the work and commitment that she has shown on this issue uh, but to more uh, generally sum up, uh, presiding officer, Parliament is always at its best when it works together. And on this, we are absolutely united. And in the words of Rona Mackay, I think it is time that we blow the whistle on homophobia and use that as our opportunity to work together to make the progress that we all seek. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.